Okay. All right, everyone, welcome to the workshop. Um, just so you guys know, this uh, workshop will be recorded. Um, I'll let our host take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm sorry it's a few minutes late. Um, I am going to today talk to you about how the, the beginning steps of how you would hack a vulnerable router. So a little bit about me. I'm a vulnerability researcher with um, Cisco Talos. And yeah, I know that I don't need to be giving like a pep talk to, to you guys about being computer scientists, but I'm going to just kind of do that pitch anyway. Um, it took me a pretty long time to realize that there's there's no roadmap for life or career or what things are supposed to look like. And we all kind of just have to figure it out as we're going. But something that I wanted to highlight is that looking back on on my path, it's it's been my mentors that have really influenced me and like the trajectory that I've taken. And um, just a little bit of unsolicited advice. Um, I, I just wanted to give some advice on choosing a good mentor, someone that you admire that, that might be in a place where you would like to see yourself one day or someone that, that has a quality that you really wish that um, for you, yourself to have more. And um, it can be tough to kind of like reach out and, and try to try to ask someone to make some time to talk with you. But anyone that I've ever asked to mentor me has never turned me down. And it is a, it is intimidating to go and take that step, but it, it really is the, it's the outside um, learning that you get from, from just different experiences and stuff like that. I think you guys all already are well-versed in that, but um, I just wanted to make sure to mention it because it's it's been made a huge impact on my career and, and my life. Um, and just a little story, um, like thinking back to when I first got started with programming, um, it was it was this high school like Visual Basic course, which I don't even think Visual Basic is used anymore. Um, but it just was interesting because then I also took a, a web development course, and they were both taught by women, and that was like my first um, first experience seeing that like oh like this like women can do this too, and like not only can they do that, but they can they can teach people and um and eventually in college I went to I went to Towson um but my computer science 101 teacher um Dr. Blair Taylor uh I really like admired her and she really had a great way of um showing depth of of her knowledge while still being approachable and so that was the first thing I did is once I realized that like she was someone that I wanted to like embody um, I, I switched immediately to have her be my advisor for the rest of my time at school. So um, if you see someone that, that's doing what you see, think you want to be doing, um, you can ask them about like what it's what it's really like, you know, grass isn't always greener type of thing, or just how they got to be where they are. Um, and it's just so inspiring to hear about other people's life paths. So um, yeah, that's my little mentoring spiel. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I like to garden. I'm a mom. I have uh, five-year-old twins that just started kindergarten. Um, and I like hiking and hacking. Um, we'll get into a little bit about like, this is very similar to the type of hacking that you guys are doing. Um, but also like one of the skills that I picked up over, uh, you know, quarantine, like doing wacky things around the house is I started making balloon animals for my kids. And, uh, you know, you don't have to be too impressed with that because um, it's basically just variations on a, on dog, the dog, right? That's like the basic um, balloon animal thing. So um, on this slide, I had a little shout out to a, uh, a Unix utility called Who Am I? Does anyone know what that tool does? Does anyone want to shout it out? It's not, I mean, it's just like, I'm trying to make a joke. It um so it tells the the currently logged in user and I was just I thought that would be me to make a little like who am I my name's Kelly and I'm on Slack um I'm also on the the Technica Discord that at K possible eight um so yeah if anyone would like like me to mentor you or talk talk some more about like what I've done um or talk about about me about what your goals are I'd be, I'm happy to do any of that and and I'll be around afterwards too. Um, if you want to um, know some more resources, I have some resources in this in this deck for for learning more about hacking. So, um, let's see. Gotta advance the slides. 
the closed captioning is like in front of, oh, there we go, sorry. Okay, so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, today. This is just kind of an overview of what we're gonna go through, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about what Cisco Talos does, um, just a tiny bit, because I know that's not super exciting. Um, and then we'll get into the, the meat of the workshop where I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what a vulnerability researcher actually does. And um, I'll walk you through the process of finding vulnerabilities in this device here. Um, and I'm gonna make sure to, to keep an eye on the time to make sure I leave some time for a question and answer portion. So I hope we can get through all of the, the stuff that I wanted to show you guys. Um, and just to let you guys know, for people that are in the room, um, I'm going to be asking for a few volunteers to come up and like drive, you know, hands on the computer, do the commands. Like um, I'll, I'll walk you through all of it and, and try to explain what's going on um, for the exercises. So if you guys can, you know, start thinking about if you want to be a volunteer, I would really appreciate it um, when we get to that point. So first part is what does Cisco Talos do? And I think it's a pretty good way to highlight just all of the different um, expertise areas that you can have within cybersecurity. Um, Cisco Talos does a lot of it. Uh, they, they do threat intelligence for Cisco, the larger Cisco corporation. And there's all of these different areas within Talos that do that. And I'm not going to go and talk about each of those, but um, I wanted to point out that the team that I'm on is vulnerability research and discovery. And what we do is we are on the lookout for weaknesses in software and hardware um, in, in systems that are connected to Cisco networks so that when we find those weaknesses, we can help get them fixed and protect Cisco customers. So I'm, I'm mentioning that because towards the end, I'm gonna kind of talk about the full life cycle of like finding a vulnerability and then what, what do we do after we, after we find it too. So. Um, now, what does, a, what does a vulnerability researcher do? So it's kind of, it's kind of, I mean, so hacking is the easiest way to describe that, um, but I'm gonna kind of walk through like where I came from and how I ended up where I am now. Um, reverse engineering is a big part of, of what vulnerability research is. And um, through my undergraduate degree, my graduate degree, I started realizing that I like doing low level things, which if you're familiar with that, like there are high level languages like, like C and Java and Python. And then there's low level languages, which are the actual instructions that the machine is executing. So that's what you're looking at when you're reverse engineering. Um, but um, so right out of college, I started as a, a government contractor and I actually spoke here about five-ish years ago doing an Arduino workshop. There are those little microcontrollers that you can like flash LEDs with. Um, again, I like low level programming, so that, that was great. Um, and I really enjoy figuring out how things work. So early on in my career, I realized that I do like writing software, but I really enjoyed the debugging process. Like when there was a problem, I, I actually had fun when there was a problem because I got to like look at the, look at the um, exception handling code, figure it, trace it back, figure out what went wrong. Um, so reverse engineering was a good fit for me. And I did have the chance to do some of that in my first job. Um, and I quickly learned too that even more fun is once you're able to figure out what's going wrong, you can try to find other ways to break it in more interesting ways. So um, that it's kind of like doing puzzles for me. So I, I really enjoy doing that. And so what I, what I did in my career at that point was I tried to I tried to find ways to do more of that, you know, talking, talking with my manager, but I was a little bit limited with, with working for a government contractor because I had to do what the government was contracting us to do. So um, Talos, the Talos team had an opening for a full-time vulnerability researcher, which means I get to do that all of the time. And um, I really, I really jumped at it because it, it also was for embedded systems, which um, I don't know, is anyone familiar with like the difference, what, like what an embedded system is? It's, it's pretty much anything that isn't like your typical PC. So like a laptop is running applications, but like this would be an embedded system because it's running um, not, not like a typical operating system. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. The question was if like a gaming system would be considered an embedded system. And I do consider gaming system an embedded system because it, it gets a little tricky when you're talking about like Xbox because it's running a variant of Windows, but um, it's it's really custom for, for that hardware for performance reasons. So it's it, it gets a little fuzzy because yeah, like phone are phones embedded systems? Like sometimes, but it's getting more of like an operating system. So um but the type of stuff I'm more drawn to are like the, like if you think about what an embedded system is like in a healthcare, like in the hospital, the the machine is running software on that on that like uh, scanner or whatever, right? So stuff like that. Um, so I really jumped at the opportunity to do this full time because it's it's a team of really smart people. And um, that's really the, the best way that I've found to learn new things is to, to, to be around people and ask lots of questions and just be curious. Um, so just the overview of kind of like what I do on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis is I find vulnerabilities in the software. And then once those are found, I report them to the vendor, like whoever makes that device. And I help them to understand what the root cause was, because it's one thing to say like, oh, this packet crashes your thing. Um, but it's another thing to say that you, this packet crashes the thing because you didn't check for this in this one specific field, right? That gives them a lot of an advantage to like help fix it. Um, and then we also have a tool called Snort, which allows you to write rules to block network traffic. And that's the way that we protect our Cisco customers is that we, when we discover a way to exploit a system, we write the rule to block that so that even before it's been fixed, people with, with Cisco um, networks are, are protected from that, from that exploit. And, um, and then eventually the vendor will, will typically itch, issue a patch so that everyone with their device is, is then protected. So, so um, this device is called the IoT GOAT. And I don't really know what's up with like why it's called IoT goat um, because you know like I've only really ever heard the term goat in a like positive context like you know greatest of all time but like this is an intentionally insecure device so it's obviously not the greatest router of all time right it's like probably one of the worst routers of all time um, and I also like I was thinking about maybe they're like going for you know, the animal goat is like insecure somehow, but, but I don't know, goats seem pretty resilient to me. Like they eat anything. So uh, I don't really, I, I, if, if anyone has a good idea, like, let me know. Cause I was, I was like pondering that for a while of like why it's called IOT goat. Um, but this thing is actually running software that's open source and it's made by this group called OWASP. And I've actually made use of OWASP a lot. So um, what it what they have is like intentionally vulnerable um, applications. This is a, a, an entire system that's intentionally vulnerable. Um, but I use it for practicing things that I've never worked on before because knowing that there is is a vulnerability there is kind of sometimes half the battle. A lot of times it's difficult to be looking and looking and looking and you're not sure if you're ever going to find anything. So. Um, it's meant, it's meant to help teach the types of vulnerabilities you might find in these things. Um, so some of the other things that they have, they have something called a, a damn vulnerable web application, which again, I use that because I didn't have much experience doing like web application security stuff. So it, it, it gives you practice in doing things like cross-site scripting um, or command injection and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's available online and I actually have um, some VMs that I can I can share with you guys if you're interested in working on working with this device some more after today. But it's running on this is on running on a Raspberry Pi actually and um, they also su supplied a um, this device emulated within a VM so you don't actually need to have hardware to run this. But um, it's more fun when you do so that's why I actually have it with hardware. So the first step in doing vulnerability research is that um, you want to choose a good target. And, and the way that I try to typically look for something that would be a good target is I'm looking at what's called the attack surface. And that is basically all of the points within that system that an attack could get in. And um, so 
what I want to do there is like look at what the features of the device are, what services it's running, what interfaces are there, what data does it take in, and and what are some applications that are that are meant to be run on that. And it's you know just trying to to make it more likely that I'm going to find vulnerabilities. It's better to have a big attack surface, right? If there's only if you can only send like if there, there's only one port open and it's it's just doing this one protocol, sure, there might be vulnerabilities there. But like if there aren't, then you know I've just kind of wasted my time with that. So I like to find ones that have lots of attack surface. And um, the second thing to think about is like kind of in terms of of what's the impact if one of these devices like had a problem in it? Um, does it affect real people? Like are real people using this? Um, and, and by that, I mean, like, is it a device that's used for medical data or transportation? Or um, a lot of times what I end up looking at are industrial control system devices. Are they used in factories and or for like power generation? So try to, I try to think about like, how how widely used is this device and and you know what kind of impact would it have if something is is wrong with it and it's exploited in the wild when i'm thinking about choosing a target so this is kind of an overview of like the research life cycle and it's you can kind of think of it i mean i know we're all familiar with like the software development life cycle right um and i i wanted to to also highlight that hacking is very similar to what you guys are doing today with like a hackathon which is um when i start to talk about tools a little bit later it's kind of taking tools that already exist figuring out how it can be used to solve your problem and then like being the glue that hacks them together right so we're all you know you you're building on people's prior work to like make something new so it's kind of the same same idea here um so the research life cycle starts with information gathering um, and it's kind of like the design phase that you would have in software development. Um, you're trying to get the landscape of like what the problem is, like your problem definition. And um, you're trying to just get all of that information so that then the next phase, which is prioritize findings, you can make smart decisions about where to spend your time first, because that's that's really what you're trying to do is make sure that you're not going to be going down a down a lead that is, is leading nowhere. You want to try to prioritize the things that are going to have be most likely to have vulnerabilities um, and that are most likely to have a big impact there. Um, and during your information gathering, there's some things that you can learn about the device while it's offline or without actually interacting with the device itself. So you could do something like that before you ever even um, acquire the device like you can look online for documentation explaining the features or explaining protocols that it uses um, sometimes applications are available for download for and then sometimes you can even get like firmware update files we're going to be looking at a firmware update file today um, and then um, later on in the information gathering phase when you actually do have the device you can do some some things actively, which is known as like the online um, information gathering phase, things like port scanning or capturing network traffic, just trying to understand how this device works as it's meant to out of the box. Um, and then next, once you've got all that information, you have some ideas of like what paths you might want to take to look at. So then you kind of sit down and prioritize findings based on where you think is going to like be the, the most bang for your buck on spending your time. And once you've prioritized things, then you kind of go one by one and um, perform your deeper analysis to really look and, and see, try to see things all the way through, answer all of the questions that you have about that and understand that piece of code fully. And whenever something comes up during that de deeper analysis that you think might be a vulnerability, then you kind of bump over to test your theories and then you kind of keep iterating back over that. You, you think there might be something and then you, you try to test it and see what, what conditions it, it happens under, what conditions it doesn't. Maybe it didn't turn out to be vulnerable even though you thought it was. Um, and so that's pretty much it. It's kind of a, a feedback loop there with like deeper analysis and testing your theories. So. So we're gonna go ahead and do the first, the first step in our research for this device. And we're going to be doing um, the information gathering phase. 
So we have, we can do some offline, um, offline information gathering with like looking at the, the user's guide. There's a firmware update file. Let me see if I can easily switch out of pre presenter view here. Okay, that seems to work. Are we good on Zoom too? Oh, okay. Let's see. It did? Okay. What do you see now? Okay, cool. Um, so this is this is the GitHub page for this, and they they just this is what you know I'm calling the the user's guide. There's a there's a web server running on this device, and um, it has some some authentication going on, has some configuration settings, and um, wireless settings that you can tell. And then this looks like it has some sort of shell running on it. So we've already learned a little bit about that there. Now, if I switch back, what are you seeing now? Still the, the browser? Okay, that's, that's fine. I'll, I'll switch it. How's that? Okay. Um, we also were able to get the firmware update from that um, from that GitHub repository. So we're going to use that for for an offline tool called Binwalk, which what that's going to actually I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about it. But that's just going to pull the firmware file apart for us to do some more um, some more investigation on. And we can look at files. There, there are some plain text files in that firmware. So we'll just use a hex editor and uh, and read through the user's guide. A lot of times you can learn a lot just from the actual like devices documentation. Some things are actually well documented. Um, and we'll also do an online tool called Nmap, which is a network scanning tool. And one thing that I did want to mention is that I am using a um, unmanaged switch here so that I am connected directly into this device. So when I'm port scanning, I'm not port scanning on this network or any other network. That's something you want to make sure that you're not doing because you will get in trouble with whoever's running your network if you try to port scan on a on like a network that other people are doing real things on. Um, the tools that we're going to use in the toolbox, they're not they're not magic. They're not doing things that are totally black box and 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 um, and magical. I'll do my best as we're going through to describe what the tools are actually doing under the hood. And many times, because this is like an, an educational one, it'll seem like it just worked, like it was just too easy. And it it sometimes is. This is like for exercises, right? But um, in out in the real world, again, it's kind of like you know the hackathon here. You want to try to reuse what you can, but you might need to tweak it for your own needs to solve your own problem. And um, so that's something to keep in mind is like if you're doing real vulnerability research and it seems like a tool isn't isn't giving you the results you expected, you may be running into a case that they hadn't taken into consideration before when writing that tool. So that's another part of the job, too, is like um, just having to to figure out um, your own solutions for things and en enhancing some tools that already exist. So um, for this, I'm going to switch out of presentation drive or presentation and have have one of you guys come on up to drive if you want. Um, so Binwalk is an open source tool for analyzing and reverse engineering and it's extracting firmware images. So I'm going to uh, just have uh, would anyone like to come up and and drive to run this command? Okay, come on up. So let me get the screen ready. 
What's that? I don't know any coding. Oh, that's all. That's all good. <laughs> okay, you guys aren't seeing anything. Okay. Let me get logged in, and let's see Zoom. Uh, have a now. So, um, how's the? I'll make it a little bit bigger. Let's see, Zoom. Can everybody see that? Can you read it? I'll just do one more. Okay. All right. So, um, have you? What, what's your name? Nika. Nika. Okay. Thank you for joining me. Um, have Have you done a, a much with uh, like command line tools before? Mm, just ping this. Okay. You can pick that. Actually, let me make sure. That's a good thing to make sure. I I am running again. I have this closed network here, so I'm running a DHCP server on here, so that this device is given an IP address and it's all internal to this VM. So. I, I see it. Uh, IoT Goat has gotten a, an IP address for me. So, um, do you want to go ahead and, and try to ping that IP address? Just make sure we're all set up correctly. Oh, you got an E. That's okay. Or Control C out of it, out of the command. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Mm hmm. Oh yeah, up. You went past it. Sorry. You're good. Oh, it's good. It's all good. I think you just went back to the beginning. Oh, Oops. There we go. Oh. Oh wait, that's not. Sorry. Just type it again. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. So we're we're pinging it just to make sure that it actually is. Yep, and then just hit enter. All right, so we're we're able to ping it. So we've got our network working. Yeah. So we have we have this tool called Binwalk, and um, here I've moved you to the desktop because this is the firmware image here, this IoT Goat Raspberry Pi two image, and um, all you're going to do is run Binwalk. It's just lowercase b i n w a l k. And then this is showing you what I've run in the past. So yeah. you still have to type it, but dash E or TAC E stands for extract. And then you give it the file name of the firmware file. And this is definitely, oh, I think capitalization with IoT. I think I had a capital T. Um, the, what it seems like with, with this tool, it does seem actually kind of magical because it sometimes just works and it, it will fully pull apart the firmware image file. And many times you'll get a, especially if it's a Linux based system, you'll get full no. file system access and you'll have just applications that you can then start reverse engineering. But it's, um, and go ahead and press enter. And it prints out a lot of information about what it's finding out about that, um, about that file. Um, and so what it's doing is it's it's looking it's it's not doing anything magical. It just has lots of different common file formats that is baked into this tool. And so what it's doing is it's taking this file and it's just scanning for patterns of seeing like does this look like a compressed section header? Like because all those things are documented, right? Like what compression looks like, what certain file systems look like. So it attempts to see that and then when it sees a compressed section with with the extract flag it goes ahead and it tries to um, what's def deflate extract. It tries to extract it, yeah. Or it tries to uh, like a compressed section tries to uncompress it. That's the word I was looking for, and um, and just give you what would actually be running on the device. Because when you're when you're shipping a firmware update file, you know you want it to be small, compact, but then but it needs to be like decompressed in order to actually run the code in it. So um, then once, once you ran that, we now have this, this new directory. So we'll, we'll go in there and just kind of, sometimes with, with directory name and file names, you can tab and it'll, it'll complete for you what's there. And we can look and see what kind of stuff started to extract. So this, um, this right here, 
squash FS root is the file system. It's a it, that squash FS is a is I probably open source because it's right. Yeah, exactly. And so it's the root file system. So that's kind of why it got that. But this is a whole like Linux file system here. And so what we're gonna what is interesting about this is um, let's see. Okay. On Linux, the way that um, user credentials are handled is there's two files. There's a file called Etsy password, and then there's another file called Etsy shadow. And um, if what's interesting here is that usually there, here's the password file and um, here's the shadow file. Typically the shadow file isn't, isn't readable by any other user than the root user, which it, in Linux systems, the root user is like the, the super user. They can do anything to the system. So that's the one, the user that should be like the most locked down. So, but in this, we actually, we're, we're not logged into anything. We're just looking at the file, but we have access to this file. So um, have you ever used the tool cat? It basically just prints. Yeah, it is, right. Okay. So, so you can concatenate two files together or you can use it to just kind of like print to the console what's in a file. So I'm gonna do that to show what's in the shadow file. And um, here we see two users that, um, that have this, this crazy looking number here. That's actually an encrypted password. So it's, it's encrypted and um, there's, but we see two users that have that. And then the password file, oops, password. The password file contains not the password information, even though it's named that, that would seem, it sh tells you what, what shell, like which users have shell access. So we see that, that this user has a shell, but all of these other users don't have a shell. So they could be used for like, um, sometimes you need a specific user to give the correct permissions to like certain binaries. And these are typical like service names like FTP and, and stuff like that. So those don't actually, when it doesn't have a shell, that means you can't actually log in as that user. So this, you know, still our information gathering phase, but this is something really interesting that we found just from being able to look at the, the firmware file. Um, so thank you so much thank for coming you. up. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. I know, it, you know, I enjoy having you guys help with this. So, um, all right. So that is the information we got from that offline tool. And um, let's see. I'm going to make sure to share again. So that that was a little bit of how to use Binwalk and we're we're definitely going to use what we've um what we the information we got from that a little bit later. And um okay, but before we go deeper on this specific thing, we're we're going to collect some more information. So Let's see. You don't have to go to all the workshops. Um, okay. Nmap stands for Network Mapper, and it's an open source tool for for network discovery and security mm -hmm. auditing. So it's it's definitely a tool that you want to use when you have a device that you absolutely do not know what it's doing at all. Um, and you give it an IP address, and what it's doing that seems magical is that it's reaching out to that device and trying to connect to it on any, on any of the ports that you specify. So it's actually going out and say, trying to connect. And if it gets a, um, if it gets anything back, like any sort of acknowledgement or anything, then it knows um, that something's at that IP address. But if it, if it actually goes about to initiate a TCP connection and it begins to open a TCP connection, then it knows that that port is actually open on that device. So again, before ever um, logging into this device or anything, we can, we can do a port scan on it and try to figure out, yes, what's, what's your question? A lot of very technical sure, yeah. Uh-huh. Sure. Um, so this, I'll, I'll try to do it in a slightly, she, she asked for an explanation of like when I would do this um, in my job. 
in um, in layman's terms. So I I guess I have a like unique job in this where I do this a lot just because I'm looking at devices where I don't know what what it's running. But let's say would it would it would it help you if I answered it in a different way? Where if you're a software developer, when would you ever need to use Nmap? Is that kind of a type of a data analyst, when would you ever need to use Nmap? So a lot of times it, it could be used for like debugging. Like you're, you have a server that you need to interact with. And for some reason your application's not working and it's supposed to be working on port like 5580 and it's just not working. So the first thing you're gonna try is instead of walking to the server room, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna try to, to look deeper and see like, is this thing even online? just trying to do that from your desk. So it's kind of a tool to help you troubleshoot without being hit. I mean, like, you know, if, if something's not working, you know, first step is like, go walk to it, make sure it's didn't, it's plugged in, right? But um, but the, all, these utilities have, they do have uses outside of, um, of hacking. So, um, but this, it's actually really widely used also instead of just with devices by like malicious actors, if you, um, if you get access to a network, that's one of the first things that an attacker would want to do is to look around and see what other IP addresses are around and what other services are there that they could then pivot to. So it's kind of a way to, to them gather information and like conceal their tracks and like move from machine to machine. So it is kind of it's it's a utility, but it's it's you know it's used widely by by hackers. Great. Yeah, no problem. Did that answer your question? So, yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, and this is, I refer to this as like an online tool because now we're actually like interacting with the device itself. Previously, we were just like looking at the file. We could do that without the device, but this we actually need to have the device so that we're seeing what responses it's, it's giving to us. Um, and again, because it's used widely by attackers, if you're on a network with other computers and stuff like that, it's definitely a no-no, you will get blocked. And, um, and I, I'm going to I'm going to just do this one because it's it's pretty quick, but um, I'm not going to bring anyone up for this one um, okay. just to kind of try to keep it keep it moving. But it there are it, this tool will will um, okay. I'm sorry I'm distracted because I'm trying to switch windows. But this this tool will let's see. Green. Okay. All right, we're seeing that. Okay. So this tool, you just provide it with an IP address and it's going to, by default, just scan the top 1000 ports that are most commonly used. But there are six, I, I'm gonna mess up the number. Um, it's 65535, five, so 6,000, no, 65,535 possible options for ports. So that's a lot. I actually did that um, earlier this week because it took about an hour to run that port scan. Because again, it's going out and it's connecting to each of those ports, trying all of the ports. So we'll just see what the quick results give us, um, if there's anything that looks interesting there. And what I'm looking for here is I'm, I'm using the IP address that we already knew from, from this device. And what I'm looking for here is something, I wanna know what it's running. And I also wanna see if there's anything custom going on. So I wanna know if there's a port that I should look at that's non-standard because that, that typically will reveal that it's um, something that was written just for this device. And usually that's where mistakes happen, right? Is when you're doing one-off things that um, hasn't been, fully audited and, and things like that. So that's where my attention goes with stuff like that. Um, but this, this should only take about a minute, um, I hope. It, it does give you an update if you feel like hit enter a couple times. Um, has anyone done any network programming before, like with sockets or anything? No? Okay, so that's that's one thing to know is that sometimes if you're if you're writing your own protocol, you have to write both ends of it, and um, that that's another time you might you might use Nmap is if you're troubleshooting some of your own code that you write that's talking between systems. Um, you'll need to know if 
if the host is up and if if the, the port that you had your application on is running. We're getting there. While it's while it's doing that. Um, it works and we have quite a lot of I'll just wait. I, I really get excited when I'm researching and I find something that is a custom protocol because I that's the the type of reverse engineering that I enjoy most is looking at protocol analysis. Um, so let's see that took mm -hmm. like a little, little over a minute. So this is showing it, it, it again it scanned the, the most <laughs> commonly used services. So port 22 is used for SSH, which that's used for logging in remotely. We are mm -hmm. going to use that. Um, and let's see, there's HTTP and HTTPS, which means there's probably a web server running on this, which actually, let's just test that out really quick, just to make sure. And again, because we're connected right to it, we can use the IP address. Okay, yeah, so we, we knew that from the user's guide, but... Just double checking for another method. But what's interesting is I these are all um, these are named services because they are so common that Nmap has them programmed in. So nothing really looks out of the ordinary here. Um, but I will show what what my results from earlier this week showed. Um, that is not that big, and I'll I'll share it on the. Zoom. I don't know how to zoom in on it. There we go. Okay, so we see the same ones that we just found, um, SSH all the way to, to 5,000. But then we see kind of here on the upper limit, there are, again, we didn't do a full scan that first time, so we didn't catch these in the first scan. Um, but we found 5515 is an unknown service. Also, 65534 is an unknown service. So immediately, to me, that's like setting off alarm bells of like, I, that's something that I want to look at deeper. So, um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, I'm not new to right. I think it's probably why they didn't continue the beginning. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that we did our information gathering, and now we're going to move on to the prioritize findings step. Um, so what, like, just to kind of review what we found here. Um, my my typical approach when I'm when I'm going through this type of stuff is to try to find the low hanging fruit, meaning the thing that's going to be the easiest for me to get like a big win or to get um, further access to the system. Right now, we don't have any access to the system. We have it. We can we can ping it, but we don't actually have any access to anything. Um, and that way, if I do, if I get more access, that's going to help me in the future because I might be able to to debug or something like that. And it also helps me to realize that, like, oh, this is a valuable place. To, there, this vulnerability was here. There's probably more vulnerabilities here. So it kind of gives me a hint of like it's it's a good idea to keep moving forward on this. Um, so we we found the password. So something that we can do with that is it is an encrypted password. So that's not actually the password we can use to, to log into the system, but we could attempt to, to crack the password. Um, and we also saw those, those two interesting network services. And um, I just wanna hear like from a show of hands, like in, prior, in these two findings, what, uh, who, who would choose to go after the, the password crack first? And again, there's no right answer, just kind of like, you know, yeah, your opinion. Who would who would tr attempt to crack the password first? Okay, we got all right. We got a couple people. Um, and who who would look at the interesting network services first? Okay, cool. So if, if I could have one volunteer from the password crack people, what what you know why why would you go for the password crack first? Go ahead. Thank you. 
I'm not going to get the finger and say they're going to be like two weeks or whatever. This we can get to uh, ask the process and ask that energy. Behind okay. It. And so I think you're, yeah, so you're trying to answer more of the question. Okay. Yeah, if I if I could summarize what you said, it's um, you you think that it would you you'd have some good ideas to guess the password, and that that could that could help you moving forward. Okay, I like that. Um, now, who who said the interesting network services? Like, can someone tell me why why you chose that? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, if I if I'm doing you know the the energy and the Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't, I can still get information without knowing. That's right. It could be true. Yeah. You don't know yet what's happening there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they said that that there's two lines of communication there with the open ports. So that 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 would be the more interesting place to go for that. So I, I was planning to originally uh, go deeper into both of these, but we only have time to, to go through one of them. So the password cracking, I'm, I'm going to make a, an executive decision. I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about how password cracking works, but I think the more interesting thing would be to demonstrate for you guys is the interesting network service, because um, I want to make sure there's some time for questions before, before we wrap up. But um, so I'm going to skip ahead past the password cracking slides. I hope you guys are OK with that. Um, but I, the reason I want to skip past password cracking is um, you, partially because it's it's really difficult to do. Like for this example, there is a an easy way to do it, but in a real world system, that's that's the whole point. That when you're making your your passwords complex with symbols and long and uppercase letters and lowercase letters, you're doing that so that it makes it so infinitely difficult to crack that it's it's not even worth attempting. And that's that's due to like time. Like it just could take, if, if you're trying every single combination that could possibly be in each position, it's just, there's not enough computing power in the world to crack a password. So the type of password cracking that we were going to do with this is something called a word list, which if, you, if you've heard about like when there's big like, uh, hacks where where they get access to like millions of users, usernames and passwords, right? They people go and make a a list of that of the commonly used passwords, and so that goes into something called a word list. And then there's a tool that you can use to um, that will just go through the word list and try all of the different passwords. Like it's not doing anything all that smart. It's just attempting all of the passwords. Um, so there you with that. That, that is a way to crack passwords if they use an, a simple one that is commonly used by other people, um, which is again why they, why we talk about not reusing passwords is that if it's ever leaked, then it could end up on one of those lists and make it easy to crack. Um, so the, but the, the kind of the interesting thing about this example is that um, one of the users we were able to crack the password in you know, like if we went down that road during this talk, but the other user we weren't because in one of the users, the that password was in the word list file. Like it has to be in the word list file for you to get to get in, right? If it's trying all of the different ones in the file, but the other one didn't have the password in the word list file. So we didn't get that password. So that's kind of what it's up to. You, you can try a simple word list thing. That was what you would try first and you could get lucky, but you also could could just get really unlucky and not be able to crack the password. So that's all I'll do is talk about password cracking with that. And I might have to go a couple slides because I think that was what I had listed first. Okay. So John is the tool. You guys, you guys have access to these slides. So if that was the tool that I was that I was planning to use to, to, to do the word list cracking. Um, but uh, for we're going to use this other tool called Netcat to, to investigate those those services a little bit closer. And it connects to the it'll connect to the TCP ports that we're interested in, and it'll start sending um, data to it. And I also I also think too we we used the word cat before, but um, net cat has nothing to do with like the pet cat. It's actually like a nod to that other tool that we used before about concatenate. So this is like concatenating on the network is kind of like what they're going for there with that name. So again, it takes a word list. Okay. 
So let's see. I, I, I wasn't going to bring someone up, but again, because we're short on time, I'm going to, going to not do that. And um, all right, let's see, switching screens again. Zoom. Where are you? Okay, so I'm using a tool called Netcat. Did I share it? Okay. And I'm gonna go for the um, the port five five one five. I'm just gonna try that first, just no real reason. Um, and there, the the options here slash n slash v. I'm pretty sure v is verbose, but N means don't try to look up the host name before connecting to it. Just connect directly to the IP address and like see what's there. So that's literally what this tool is doing is it's initiating a TCP connection. It's not actually sending anything yet. It's just gonna try it. And um, we'll just see, we'll just see what happens here. Um, so that's that was cool. Um, there's there's just a back door there. And what a what a backdoor means is not done so much anymore after people have gotten more security smart. But there used to it used to be pretty common for there to be like a developer backdoor into something because when you're troubleshooting, you need access to the system. So it used to be okay to just have a port that was unknown and no one knows about it, so it's secure, right? But it's actually not because here here we are and we can list like let's just see what some commands do. So the ID command, I use that because I, I, I've been working on this this past week, so I knew that it doesn't have the who am I command. But when I do ID, it says that I'm logged in as root. So it's actually a root backdoor. And um, some further, further work that, that you guys could do on this if you're interested is this isn't a full a full interactive shell like you would get with SSH, but using this backdoor, you can probably launch processes. Like if we if we look at the process list, um, we see that this is what we just launched, PS. And let's see if we do, yeah, we're, so that shell back might be the backdoor process name, but it looks like we might be able to use this to launch another process or move files over to here. So that's, this is the type of additional access that you would want to be able to um, to just enable more further research for yourself. So I'm going to go ahead and jump back to the presentation, try to wrap up and have some Q and A. Let's see. And. All right, so um, we we did find two vulnerabilities. We did, assuming we cracked one of the passwords. I'm gonna kind of breeze through this because um, the inter interesting stuff was what we already did. Um, but that's a persistent backdoor that's always there, so we can we can use that. And you know, in the real world, in my job, if I discovered these two vulnerabilities, um, I just I'll kind of breeze through this too because I kind of already walked through it. But we make sure that none of the system Cisco customers are vulnerable to this by like we protect them with a with a rule that would block that traffic. Like we like for that port, we could just say this port is not supposed to be used on this device and just say no, don't don't even that back door is as if it doesn't even exist. Um, and when a vendor sometimes they come back to us, like it'll be really hard to fix this to remove that. And so we can give them an extension if they need it to to fix their problem, but for the most part, we don't. Um, and I did list some of my favorite additional resources. If you're interested in like in vulnerability research or computer security, like capture the flag competitions are the way to go. That's the way to learn and get hands-on experience. So I listed some of my favorite ones here. And um, the for IoT Goat, the that GitHub rep repository has the actual image for this for this device. And like I said, you can download it as a VM. And then the, the VM that I'm using also for this is just Kali Linux. So I um, it's, a, it's a flavor of Linux that has a lot of, of security tools already in it. 
Um, and I can share also in Slack a OneDrive link where you can download the, the VM that I used today, um, or you can get it from Cali. And, um, but yeah, I definitely suggest doing some of these if you're, if you're interested in learning more. And um, here's another slide with lots of cool Talos ways to, to see what we're up to. We have a blog where we, we talk a lot about our, our work in this stuff. And um, so that's that. And okay, very probably can take a couple questions. Um, but again, you can get me on Slack, Discord, um, and then there's the Talos stuff again. So does anyone have any questions? I know that was a lot. Yes. It does, yep. Mm -hmm. it does, the question was, does Kali Linux have Netcat on it? And it does. Thank you guys so much. I really had fun putting this together. And um, yeah. Happy hacking. Thanks.